this is a, a huge uh, session to, to uh, get our teeth into, but luckily I've got uh, three of the most brilliant uh, people here on the panel who are going to answer the question about farming in East Anglia and where do you go from here. So if any farmers are in the room, you're going to be in no doubt of your every single next move. And if you're buying food, you're going to know exactly the kind of food you're going to need to buy. Uh, so that's great. And I'm going to come really much from the premise that, you know, farming has to change. And it has to change in, time, in, in, in terms of true cost accounting for food production, for farmland biodiversity loss, healthier soils, and uh, we need to be the solution to climate change rather than the problem. It's about community, uh, rural cohesion, and better, healthier farmers. So my panel uh, is, first of all, we have the former uh, barrister, Sarah Langford, who's written a book called Rooted, who is, who is available outside, who maps her own journey on her own family farm, but also accounts for uh, some inspirational farmers uh, who have changed their business inexorably uh, for the better. And so I think Sarah's voice really sort of comes from the sort of human angle and uh, culture. Uh, Jake Fines has watched our countryside change uh, for the worse and for the better during his career, ranging from gamekeeper uh, to director of conservation at Holcomb. And uh, Jake is our land healer, which is conveniently, I didn't make that up, it's actually the title of his book, uh, which is also available. Um, Desire um, cut his teeth working for a non-for-profit uh, organization Anglia Food Link, but frustrated by the slow pace um, of change, he founded Homodods, uh, who worked with farmers like me uh, to grow appropriate crops uh, that can affect the change that we need. So just to give you a little bit of background, these are some DEFRA statistics for, from 2019 to give you some context of where we are now. Um, so, and, and just talking about our region. Um, so in 19, 2019, uh, the biggest, biggest contributors to the value of EA agriculture output of 3.4 million was wheat, uh, poultry meat, fresh vegetables and pigs. So we've been hearing a lot about how much the, the wheat that we grow on a farm goes into pigs and poultry, and that's, that's, uh, they're, they're the facts for you. Um, total farm income uh, from farming has increased by 31%. Uh, between 2005, uh, 2015 and 2019 to 885 million, so it's growing. Uh, also in e the east of England, we have uh, bigger average size farms uh, from uh, the average in, in, in England is about 87 hectares, and in East Anglia there are 121 hectares, so circa around sort of 300 acres. So, so, you know, where have we come from and uh, where are we, uh, are we now? And in terms of sort of cultural references in the environment and food production. Um, so I'm going to turn to Sarah, first of all. Um, we've got some great uh, cultural references to uh, navigate where we have come from in terms of our East Anglian farming history. But, but first of all, you, you came from a family farm in Hampshire. Mm and then moved to a, another family farm, your husband's family farm in Suffolk, where you undertook to take it on uh, with two uh, young children, uh, was also writing a book, uh, went to do a, a, a study at the Royal Agricultural University, and, and you converted to organic. I cannot think what you were thinking of. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I just want to, if, if, coming from Hampshire, and the lovely Hampshire Downs, uh, coming to Suffolk, and, and the only the, 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 the familiarity between the two counties is that we both have some black and white sheep with sort of wool, uh, with this white and then a black face and, and some black, black legs. Uh, uh, yours have a little bit more wool on the head, which makes them a little bit uh, more difficult to shear. So, so having a sort of a similar coloured sheep, but a slightly inferior one on your part. <laughs> what are the major sort of differences culturally, do you think, between that sort of rolling landscape of the Hampshire Downs and Suffolk? I mean, well, you said it, there are hills there. <laughs> and I've never, before we moved to Suffolk in 2017, which was completely by accident, I had been living in London for a decade and had no plans on becoming a sort of sheep person. And, uh, and then when my husband lost his job, we, we decided to have a break from reality without realizing that we were tipping straight into the middle of reality. And uh, I think I'd never before really, although I've been going back and forward to Suffolk for a long time, stood in a field where I couldn't see the beginning or the end. The fields around us are, are vast and flat. And when I go back to Hampshire, which is, I grew up in Winchester, my, um, my grandparents were who were post-war farmers and my uncle, 
um, farm in just outside the village in Cheriton. And it's, I go back and it seems dinky and tiny with these winding hills and hedgerows. And so the sheer scale of East Anglian arable land was like a bit like landing on the moon. And I realise the comparison is nothing if you take it down to Devon and no. the hedges down there. But it, it, in a way, that was an exciting, an exciting challenge. And I should, the, this whole talk, I should say, John thinks that he's chairing it. <laughs> but we've agreed, that as he is the farmer on this panel with the most experience, we may well just pivot some of these That's questions straight back. because it's not going to happen. We would not... <laughs> um. We would so, not be farming organically if we hadn't come to your farm and seen what you can do on well, that, that's very the kind of you. land. And uh, you're very, I, I'm flattered hugely by that comment. <laughs> um, Sarah, but what about your cultural references when you're mm. writing your book? I mean, we've got a sort of wealth of wonderful authors from Suffolk, older ones and, and ones from the last century. What were your sort of cultural references? Well, again, this was not a... You know, I had no intention... I hadn't intended to fall in love with farming. I wore a black suit for 10 years and was in a courtroom and felt like that was my kind of old life. So it's not something that I... Uh, I was very ignorant about the literary tradition with it. I think that's the thing that is so interesting about agriculture and why it's not just a job. It's not just how you spend your time. The, the quality of its literary tradition is extraordinary. And what's even more extraordinary is that so much of it's based mm. in Suffolk, when you're looking at Adrian Bell's books. And even someone like Lady Eve Balfour, who farmed half an hour away from us, who everybody knows her for being co-founder of the Soil Association and writing a kind of pivotal book called The Living Soil in 1943, shows us that you know they knew the soil was alive 100 years ago. It's taken us... 100 years to remember. But she also wrote a best-selling crime fiction series with her female lover and partner, which one of which was called The Paper Chase because she was riding so fast on her motorbike with the transcript that it flew out of the back of her, uh, her carrier and she had to pick it out of all the fields and gave it its name. So there's something, there is something about this tradition of farming and the cultural side of it and a literary tradition which has been kind of well wedded for mm. many, many years. And it's, it's really interesting to see those sort of examples of sort of back to the land writers sort of come back and get some kind of reality after sort of, you know, two great wars. Mm. Um, my, my, for my own, uh, it was uh, Ronald Blythe and reading Aikenfield. Yeah. It really helped, helped me understand the people on our farm. It was about yeah. the people. And the references were just fantastic. And we had a farm where most of the men were single and they were of a certain age. And it was because actually when they were, where they were, were to be married, uh, the sugar wheat factories opened in Berries and Evans and Ipswich. And uh, you could go there and get a, a regular job and you could see your girlfriend at weekends. Um, so uh, it was just a fascinating thing for me. Um, uh, Jake, and actually Charles Clover uh, helped me out a little bit on this because he made a comment about um, uh, land ownership and, uh, and, and rewilding the sea. It was much easier because actually there were fewer owners of the sea, mm -hmm. so you could make better decisions. But you've worked in a range of roles for larger estates, Nep and Ravingham and Holcomb, uh, but you've also been uh, uh, an observer of how land has been managed privately uh, and also by tenants. And, and given that a third of the agricultural land in East Anglia is, is managed by the tenanted sector, I just wondered if you'd had any observations on uh, how ownership has helped, it, helped or heeded uh, the way that we manage our land. And I suppose that, you know, it, have we got the, you know, the, the right sort of land ownership uh, for, for the future? And, 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 and does size matter, as William uh, uh, outed me from being a large cereal farmer in the last session. Uh, but but what, what's your view of that, Jake? Because you've seen a range of the, this different... So, so uh, UK land ownership, there's not that many landowners in the UK for, the, for its size. 70% of the UK or England is in, is in some sort of agricultural use, whether that's extensive or whether that's uh, industrial. Um, and there are, you know, we've got pension funds that own land. We've got sort of, we've got government that owns land. I think uh, the largest landowner, you've got National Trust, which is one of the largest landowners. You've got the RSPB, which is a significant landowner. Um, but all of the landowners that I have worked for, coincidentally, uh, two Etonian and one, two Etonians and one um, uh, 
Millfield. Um, they are, they are long-term hereditary landowners. And the difference between the, uh, the ambitions of the Wildlife Trust and the National Trust, they're sort of charities and they're in perpetuity and they have specific goals. But what I find with the, the landowners that I have worked with that are institutional sort of, um, you know, they're earls and barons and whatever, um, they actually have a really long-term view and they have a long-term view with their tenants, and we saw the Baroness Rock report that came out just before Christmas, um, where uh, how the tenant sector actually, there are tenancies for, for farmers that are, are less than three years in length in term. And how can you look after land properly and actually see it evolve and see some of the challenges, specifically with climate change and how, we, how East Anglian farmers experience some of the hottest temperatures ever? How can they have a long-term view on such short-term tenancies? So basically you're going to be giving all the tenants at Hulk much longer tenancies from now on. There are no negotiations going on whilst we speak. Good, because it is um, difficult. It is, it's very difficult. And, uh, and it's that, so, you know, if you are, from a landlord's perspective, um, you, uh, it's about balancing risk. So you rent half your land out and you farm half your land. So when you don't make any money by farming, at least you're, the tenants are going to pay some rent. But, 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 the, but the, what you're saying is actually you, it, the long-term view is key. The long-term uh, view is yeah. fundamental. You know, we but have do, does size matter? I mean, you know, do you, uh, I did a project, uh, a European project, and looking at farm size and uh, working with other European farms who farm smaller farms than we do. And the premise was that actually if you get bigger, it, it's worse for the environment. But actually it comes down to sort of management rather than actually size. So That's my view. I just wonder what your view is. So about. interesting. Alistair Driver, who can't answer, reply to me because he's left. But actually, from a rewilding perspective, size does matter. Yes. Well, but actually, that. from, a, from an agricultural perspective and a uh, maintenance and management of natural capital, soil, air, water, biodiversity, actually, it can, it, the size is totally irrelevant. So if you've got yeah. three hectares or 3,000 hectares, um, as long as you apply good management techniques and a long-term view... There's no reason why you... And then you're, all the connect, connectivity that Alistair was talking about earlier, you start to apply that. Well, hopefully we're going to come uh, back in that sort of next bit about vision. Uh, but just very briefly, Sarah, because your, your, uh, your family farm, where your, your um, uncle farm was a mm. tentative farm with the National Trust, what, uh, do you, can, can you give us a flavour of what his view was on you know, what he should be doing for the land? I suppose... A lot of the reason I wrote my book was for him. I mean, we are... <clears throat> my uncle, Charlie, is, I suppose, the cartoon farmer that most people in the city would both describe. He's large and ginger and angry about the world it's a lot. Also, also and, hilarious. <laughs> Sincere well, apologies to the rest of the farmers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> they... Uh, I said a city person's view of farm. <laughs> They, um, unlike most other farmers, he had a way to vent this other than the pub, which was his column in Farmers Weekly, which he wrote for 25 years, and he's just stopped. And so when I landed in Suffolk and, you know, in my very London-centric way, said, well, of course we can manage this. It, everything I believed and thought, he was the opposite of. So he, my grandparents, took on their farm five years after wartime rationing ended. And their mission was extremely clear, which was to feed the world in whatever way they could, using whatever tools they could. Uh, he took on the farm in the 80s, and the goalposts had moved by then. And so he and I were opposed on probably every single way of managing land. And yet we shared not only our family history, but a love of, for my case, a growing love of the natural world, in his case, a long-standing love of the natural world. And I think that's the biggest misnomer that um, I, city people had, was that farmers don't love nature because mm. they use chemicals. And that has but you don't think the fact that it was a tentative farm that had any sort of change, changed his view on how it should be managed? I think that's the point. Sorry, he was, yeah. well, he was on an old-fashioned three-generation tenancy. Okay, so he, yeah. So he had security to an extent... Okay. But of course, he will also tell you how much money he's paid to the National Trust over his lifetime and what that could buy him. Okay. And, and also the, the, which is important because it's a demotivation. If you're, is, not, if you're not, not investing yeah. in something... He's not considering the opportunity as well, though, that they gave him. 
Sorry. But, That's yeah. something for you to answer. But of course, <laughs> 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 but of course, his story too <clears throat> is the parable of the tenant farmer. Because yeah. when I began writing the book, he was a pilot. He had just signed on to be a pilot for the new sustainable farming incentive. And I thought, well, this is a fantastic ending because it shows that when you've got the framework right, even the most cynical of people who can't even say the word nature without curling their lip will move. Then the National Trust came to him with a large check and said, what will it take you to stop arable farming? And so that is the decision he has now made. And it's a decision that wouldn't have been available if he wasn't a tenant farmer. No. So now he is, as of last, the end of last harvest, he is still farming, but on a very small scale pasture. Mm. And 850 acres of arable have just been sown up with meadow seed for the okay. first time in probably hundreds of years. Okay. And that choice that he made to do that is only because he is a tenant farmer and has no other security otherwise. Yeah. So that's the thing. Mm. Um, Josiah, I'm going to move on to you because, um, you know, your business is very much about decommoditizing food. And, you know, I've even, and, and William alluded to it in the last uh, talk, even though we went organic and we were going niche, we just found ourselves actually producing organic commodities and the same sort of uh, cereals and, and pulses that we were producing beforehand. Uh, but in, in your view, in the sort of business you've seen and, and the sort of raison d'etre behind your, your business, is, is what has um, viewing food as a commodity done to our farms and also how they manage their farms, in your, in your view? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a massive question. Um, but I think it does refer back to some of that cultural uh, piece that we were talking about earlier. And I think if we think back to those immediate post-war years and mm. farming practice and the tools and the techniques that were used from de-stoning to the use of sickles and... George Ewart Evans writes about this beautifully mm -hmm. in his book, that that connection there stretched back 10,000 years to the Bronze Age settlers that first farmed the British Isles. And in 70 years, we've lost that 10,000-year connection. And with that, we've lost a whole culture around farming and a culture in the communities, the farming communities that used to produce that food and work in those fields. So my view, and this, this how many farmers are there in the room, just out of interest? Oh, quite a few of you. I better be quite careful. Um, <laughs> who eats food? <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> like a safer ground. Um, but I think, I think farmers have, have largely, over the last 70 years, because of that productivist paradigm, that policy frame that said we must feed the world, which I think is a misplaced uh, policy driver, have found themselves essentially factory floor operatives. You know, they're, they're told what to grow, when to sow it, what to spray on it, when to harvest it. They're told what price they're going to get for it. They don't even set the price. Uh, and they've become very good at responding to the policy framework that emerges from government. And we see a landscape that is a reflection of that policy, mm. which is no hedges for us, fewer hedges in East Anglia, um, you know, and a loss of nature and a loss of that, that connection in the landscape. And I think food and food culture really connects us to landscape. We are very much shaped by the, the geomorphology, by the by the, 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 the landscape, the ecosystem, the underlying ecosystem within which we farm, which dictates what we can grow, and then we shape a whole culture around that. And in, in Suffolk and Essex in particular, we see all the wool churches, which reflect that period when we were producing wool and sheep and we were you know, supplying the whole of Europe with very fine quality cloth. And, and we can see the same on a smaller scale with some of the crops that we're working with in other parts of Europe. For example, we grow a small, mottled, dark-coloured pea called a carlin pea, which is traditionally eaten in the north of England and has a whole, a whole tradition around bonfire night and also around Passion Sunday, Care Sunday, for, for being eaten to celebrate the turning of the year. But in parts of northern Europe, that's, that celebration is stronger and is much more embedded in a wider culture. In Latvia, they all eat these peas on New Year's Day and they represent the tears of the previous year and the coming of the, of the year to go. And it's... It's a fantastic connection, and we forget that connection. And I think by reconnecting with what's happening on farm, finding new stories, which is why your work, both of you, is so important, will, will allow us to, to rethink um, you know, health, well-being, ecosystems, and our role within all of that. And our job as a business is simply to try and make that connection between farm and kitchen, between field and plate, and encourage people to really understand where their food has come from because it's only that connection. It's not policy. It's not you know, financial mechanisms in the city. It's that connection which will affect change. 
And actually, I think, you know, and having that connection makes our job so much more creative and so much more exciting. And it does seem quite bizarre that we do eat a lot of uh, protein pulses in this country, but they come in a blue tin put uh, in tomato sauce. Mm. And, you know, we've got so many other opportunities. Yeah. And, and, and you are providing farmers and beginning to provide more uh, uh, opportunities for farmers to grow the things that we need to grow. Um, so I'm just going to go on to uh, uh, some uh, about vision. And, um, Jake... You know, we've um, you know heard a lot at the conference about you know from the one extreme to the other, so so rewilding uh, on, on one one extent. Um, and, and in your book, I love the way that you talk about edges, and it really you know got me thinking about you know actually in reality, are they the, the the points in our farm where we have the most biodiversity? And you're absolutely right, they are. So so if if, if and I was saying at lunchtime, what I'd, what I'd love to be able to do uh, uh, from the village of Shimpling and Alfina, which is where we farm around is for people to be able to look out uh, at that landscape and look at something that looks completely different uh, and uh, with the sort of corridors and everything we need. Can you sort of paint a verbal picture of how you see uh, the land in East Anglia and how it might look in sort of 25, 30 years' time? So I've created what it looks like. I've done it, I've done it where I am now and I've done it where I was before. And... Um, and Mark Cocker, who's been here, um, actually came and visited me on, on the, the estate in South Norfolk where we started to implement the vision. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, and Mark, you know, we had this one moment where I was messing around with catch crops, cover crops, but I didn't really know what, they weren't even given a name. And Mark um, had visited and was very excited about seeing, seeing wildlife where his, around his house he saw nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and he came and he, uh, he came and I said, Mark, Mark I've, got a, I've got a nature moment. It's really, nature moments don't happen very often and, and invariably people miss them or see them on Instagram. And actually, but to actually to see one for yourself, the spectacle of nature really um, showing off in all its glory, they just, you know, you just have to, they, they happen, but you just got to be aware of them. Um, so I said, Mark, come on, I've got a, I've got, I've got, Six, I've got, I know, there's about 10,000 swifts feeding off two hectares. It's a spectacle. They have come up to 60 miles. So Mark rushed, he lived about three miles, rushed down the road, um, and he turned up in a yellow T-shirt. Now, the swifts were feeding off um, uh, pollen beetles yeah. <laughs> that were blooming. So suddenly, as Mark jumped out of his car in excitement to see swifts, his yellow T-shirt went black. <laughs> But that was a nature moment. That is a connection. You know, Mary Corwell, who has written numerous books, came and visited the spectacle of... Uh, so at Holcomb, I've made small differences. We made a wetland wet. We're not doing anything out of the ordinary. I think that the Holcomb National Nature Reserve, which is just under 10,000 acres, is rewilding in its purest form. Because it's, it's been like that, it has that designation for 70 years. It had sheep grazing the salt marsh. The sheep have come off the salt marsh. The salt marsh is some of the richest and most diverse in Europe. So, but I also have a million people coming to visit. I also have, uh, I also have a, a herd of 800 single sucklers. Mm. Um, and what we do is that we get nature moments. So bringing Mary to come and see the geese. Currently, we've got about 60,000 pink-footed geese on site. And when you see them flight in the morning, and I said to Mary, come and, come and witness what the vision is. You know, you can talk about it, you can write about it, but actually come and feel it. Um, so we get there at dusk, or just a, a, a before dawn, half an hour before sunrise, and we're looking, and you can hear in the darkness the geese chattering away. Um, and I said, just before they fly, it'll go silent. And after about five minutes, suddenly stillness in the air, and then this crescendo as tens of thousands of geese lift. And I just, I was, we were all sort of fixating. Mary, Mary, nature moment. And I turned around and she's in floods of tears. Aww. And it's that passion and that energy that the natural world can give us that we are invariably all disconnected with because we're so busy leading our lives, going from A to B, picking the children up, doing the school run, got to, got to go to my next Zoom meeting, got to, you know, here, there, everywhere. Actually, we miss, we, we miss those moments. You said the word disconnected, and actually what we want to talk about is connections, because um, 
and um, what uh, we've been talk to, where we were talking about rewilding first thing this morning, uh, uh, you know, you do have to have large areas, but what you also have to understand is that it's very important to have the small areas of rewilding and how do we connect them. And I suppose that, um, so I, it's great what you're, you're doing, and that's fantastic, but how do we as farmers who are probably not going to rewild our whole farms, but we need to leave areas scruffy, how is that going to look? So to, to, to join up these bits. So if I look at, uh, if, so, East Anglia is, uh, we have medieval field systems. We also have, you know, some of them were removed in the, as part of the policy. So a lot of the land is designed by the policy. If I look at Holcombe, has probably some of the best examples of Enclosure Act hedgerows. So we have these huge square fields that someone designed. Um, if we look at technology and how agriculture has uh, intensified for mass industrial production of commodities, and we've kind of challenged some of those in the in the conference over the last two days. Um, actually, an investment of a hundred th of a quarter of million pounds worth of sprayer for those of us that use them on a regular, more regular basis than others. Um, uh, actually, you don't have a sprayer. <laughs> so, uh, so we can make space for nature by being economically focused. Okay. So, so I, so I, so I, when I uh, challenge the farming team at Holcomb uh, and say, I want you, I want you to be running a hundred percent in the field, a hundred percent of the time with your sprayer and your machinery. Um, you design the field using your GPS to do your traffic system for your tram lines to drive down. He creates the, he creates the field within a field. He removes anywhere, I, there's a precursor that I've got to have every hedgerow has got to be buffered by a hay meadow and because of the soil type I need to cultivate because I have a most amazing array of rare arable plants on this soil type and that will benefit nature. Thereafter you design the field. Some fields he took out 3%, some fields he took out 10%, one field he said I don't want to farm that, it's uneconomic. So we, we wind forward two years and this harvest I spoke to the farm manager and I said ask me three questions. Answer me three questions, the yes or no. Have you increased your yield? Have you reduced your fertilizer? And have you um, reduced your diesel? And the answer to all three was yes. So from him, for me making it, it's not messy. I don't think nature is messy. I get rather pissed off with people describing it. It's wonderful, it's, yeah. it's, it's interactive, it's diverse. It's, you know, the bramble protecting the, at oak sapling, the connection between different plants under the soil that we don't really know about, but we know it's amazing. Um, it's understanding all that. So, uh, so them understand that the spaces that they have made for nature. And if I make a hay meadow, if I, make, if I do a grass margin, they go, grass margin, is, I'm just going to drive on it or I'm going to dump my sugar beet on it because it's not. But if it's a hay meadow, it's agriculture. So if I create hay meadows and I respect them and they look attractive, yeah. I get the buy-in from farmers. And when I sat in the combine, when they combined some of the fields on this specific farm, I said to the combine driver, how's what the yield's like? And he was, you know, classic farmer, doom and gloom. But I said, why do you like coming to this farm? He said, yes, because I see, I see nature. I see things. I see the harrier gliding over the stubbles. I see the hares running through the hedgerows. And I don't see that on any of the other farms. No, and I think actually for, for me, it's really important. I said to you about the vision of people in the village looking out and seeing something different. Because, you know, if we're going to get, you know, pay, be paid for public goods, people need to be able to see it as well and they need to visualise it. Uh, um, Josiah, you mentioned uh, a sort of a vision for the Waverley Valley. And could you just, just, just go over that uh, for us? Because it was rather wonderful at lunchtime. What you oh, talked about. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think that whole idea about the connection and about hedgerows and how with headlands and, and allowing the hedgerow to be wider gives us this huge opportunity. And I think there are lots of farmers that are looking at these approaches and there's an organization called Wild East that covers the whole of East Anglia that's looking at some of the smaller pockets that might be churches or community gardens or, or back gardens or libraries. Um, so we can, we can make those, those pathways and connections happen. But I think we also need to be thinking bioregionally, you know, what is the watershed? What is the river valley like? What are the different landscapes in that valley? How do they connect together? And we tend to think very much about boundaries of ownership 
and political boundaries. You know, where does the county boundary end? Where does the country boundary end? And I think if we can begin to break down those ideas of boundaries of ownership and political boundaries and think in an ecosystem, at an ecosystem scale, we can begin to make really significant changes. And there are things that farmers can do, and you're doing this, John. This is where we turn to you. Um, so Hodmedod is a big advocate for agroforestry, a system of production that sees crops or pasture between rows of trees. And it's a, it's a productive landscape, and those, row, those woody rows might be producing fuel or, or fiber, they might be producing fruit, but they're also fantastic havens for wildlife. And John, you've done this on your farm where you've created agroforestry connections between triple SIs and ancient woodland that you've got on the farm. Do you want to talk, about, asking you a question, no. do you want to just <laughs> say yes, a little yes. bit about... Hey. Yes. No, I, I think it, it, it does come back down to actually the whole concept of um, understanding what nature you have in your farm and work out uh, pathways to get that nature out into the, uh, uh, into the open farmland, but also uh, to get the nature back in the woodland that you're probably missing. So in, in, in Alfeaton Wood, which is a triple SI, we don't have any dormice. And I could go with a shoebox down to Frithy Wood, which is five miles down the road, and nick one of theirs and put it in there. But I prefer it if it made it there by itself. So... Um, anyway, that's enough about me. Sarah, I, no. I think it's, about, it's about a functional ecosystem at landscape scale. It is. Mm. Yeah. You're right. And actually, that, that I think is my vision, and that's what I think you're painting uh, as well, Jake. Um, but Sarah, when, when, when you came back uh, to the farm in Suffolk mm. and you had this fantastic opportunity to, uh, to, to, to manage it, um, uh, you know, ha, ha, what does it look like now and, and, and where do you see it uh, going in the future? And, I, and I'm going to say the quote in your book because you say actually it's not about revolution is about the cracks that finally let the light in. And then I was going to say, can you tell us about your cracks? Uh, but then... <laughs> okay, I've, already, I, I, I've already made that joke. Because to actually, he's allowed to, it's, he's very allowed to it's very, very important <laughs> because actually all these meetings we go to is about taking one message home and do it going and doing just one thing and improving yeah. it. What were, the, what were the sort of key well, I, things that you thought you were going to have to do on your farm? Well, I obviously stole that from Lena Cohen, so you mustn't give me credit for that. But okay. um, I think... I really want to get across how fast this change has happened. When I first pitched this book, I had written a book previously, which had done very well, which was about um, the law, trying to take people into a world they didn't see very much. My agent said that farming was extraordinarily boring, she wanted nothing to do with it, and I should not write it. And that was kind of 2019. And when I sat and wrote this, I had already tripped and fallen down the regenerative farming rabbit hole, as had lots of people I'd spoken to, but in the wider farming world, particularly Farmers Weekly, people hadn't, weren't talking about it. Sure. Fast forward to now, mm -hmm. and you've got 5,500 people attending Groundswell, a regenerative yeah. farming conference. You've got us talking about it at a non-farming conference. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it, the, it's reached the public vernacular in a way that I could never have imagined. So the scale of change has been huge. And I think yeah. that is where I hadn't understood we would get to as far as we got to. In fact, and I did write another yeah. book thinking, oh my God, they're going to think it's a load of hippie nonsense. And now I'm thinking, oh, I wish I'd put more hippie nonsense in. Because and, and, and actually, that, that, that is the vision, actually, better communication and, and, th and events like Groundswell uh, and also the kind of books that you guys are writing. And also, I have to mention, uh, Josiah has a book called Sheaf, which is also available about um, talking about people uh, working in, the, in, uh, in, in farming situations and making improvements and growing the right things. Uh, so it's about communication, and that's mm. a very important uh, vision to have and to get right. Now, well, I'm I think, sorry. I think just yes. to come in on that, I think, I think also there's a, there's a problem with the way that the policy frame has worked in that policymakers, one, for one reason or another, have, have tended to frame farmers as rational actors, as rational economic actors that are going to make rational decisions based on a set of incentives, and they're not. Mm -hmm. then that's not going to happen. And, and farmers are motivated by their identity, which as, as farmers, their place in the landscape, and they are motivated by things like love for their family, for their community. They're, they're motivated by the beauty of the landscape. And I think that's the hippie stuff, isn't it? That we're quite nervous about talking about. But actually, we can own that and say, yeah, I love this landscape. It's beautiful. I want to be here. Well, that, that leads me quite nicely on to um, uh, uh, the next bit, which is actually about how do we, you know, we've given you a, a, a painted a vision. Um, but actually, how do we get there? And... Um, and talking about farmers sort of loving their currency or whatever, I remember going to NEP and Charlie Burrell said, 
Uh, he had a group of young farmers on the farm the week before, and do you know what? They didn't even know all the species of trees on their farms. Well, I'm not bloody well surprised, actually, because at the end of the day, there's such small margins in most farming systems that they are just on their tractors day in, day out, just working all the hours of the day just to try and make this tiny little margin. They can't possibly uh, be re-engaged with their farms in the way that we want them to be. And so, and, and your book very much uh, talks about, Jeff, um, uh, Jake, about um, uh, the people who are directly working in the countryside, but also about um, NGOs. And I think it's incredibly important uh, that we work, and we work with the Southern Wildlife Trust, uh, but it's about actually, uh, you know, sort of controlling that narrative to a certain ha to a extent with the, with the NGOs and actually getting them on our side. Uh, so, so how do we, who do we have to work with, Jake, and how do we re-engage our farm farmers with their, their their sort of natural capital. To um, okay, so first of all, can I challenge that um, uh, farmers are really, really busy 24-7, 365 days a year. I spoke to an arable farmer in November, and I say, what do you do from November through to the end of February? Yeah. And he said, well, I hadn't really thought. I don't do a lot. <laughs> so oh, I, livestock farmers, dairy farmers are hard at it, I, you know, yes. but actually, so... Some farmers have amazingly large amounts of time on their hand. When I, went, when I went to college, being an East Anglian farmer, they said, uh, I know what your rotation is. It's winter wheat, winter wheat, winter cruise. It doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore. So, so, Jake, that's interesting. But I, maybe you, you're talking about farmers who don't have any livestock. But most farmers I know um, uh, don't have... OK, I want them to have more time for nature. Yeah, so... Um, uh, and we look at, you know, if we look at the rise of contract farming... So actually, we have fewer people farming bigger areas. And it actually, so the, the, the farmer, as opposed to the contractor, actually has time on their hands. And they need to start to, you know, and they invariably employ gardeners or foresters or gamekeepers or wardens. There's a lot of very posh people. <laughs> I know, but no, no. So, so, but, um, what, oh, sorry, large land estates, I can't, you know. <laughs> Yeah, hands up. Um, so, but they, so actually, those people are, have the opportunity to okay. be the eyes and the ears. I think you know. I see farmers and farm uh, operators sitting uh, two meters above the soil, mm. completely disconnected. Mm. But actually, they become very efficient. And you know, and some of the, if I look at at Holcombe where I got the wardens out onto the farms because no stone curlew had been nesting at Holcombe for 20 years. And actually, so I got my field ornithologist from the reserve out onto farms just to see what we've got. Okay, so what I'm getting from that is because at Holcombe, obviously, you have all these people on site, so you can reintroduce them to them. But as for, for most of us who are sort of working slightly in isolation, you know, we've be, definitely been engaging with the people who work on our farm with, you know, soil experts and so on and so forth, which is in the past we probably wouldn't have done. But do you think we should be maybe engaging them? You know, when we have uh, Jenny Rawson out from the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, they should be coming out with her and learning with me. We should be doing it together. I, th I think effort. so. I would encourage every farmer to get an ecologist, whether whether they're with the Wildlife Trust, whether they're with the RSPB, whether they're an independent. I'm, a, I'm always amazed how the number of retired, invariably old guys out there who have a lot of times on their hand who want to go and investigate places that historically have been off limits. Mm -hmm. So actually encourage these people to see what you have on your farm. And you might be surprised. We are endlessly branded as one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. We're not number one, but we're very close. And actually... If we were to spend more time out on the farm seeing what, I think we might be surprised what we have got. You know, and if we start to baseline and actually see how we can make small management changes that will make big differences, we will be rewarded by seeing an abundance of things that historically have disappeared. You know, orchids, really simple, but orchids are something special because they only flourish when the soil conditions are right. And then there are specific butterflies that only require certain food plants. And all you do is to establish those food plants back on your farm. It's amazing how quickly those butterflies will turn up. And then we get farmer, farmer competition. And yeah. we start ramping up the ambition. Yeah. And all of these cluster groups and facilitation farms and farmers working, uh, working together, then they become trusted partners. Mm -hmm. Then actually suddenly have business and finance actually saying, actually, well, maybe we want to buy into your concept. Yeah. And then you get the added value. So it's a, you know, I think it's a really exciting time in agriculture. 
both in the UK but also globally to actually be the generation that started to put things back. 30 by 30 is a phenomenal ambition, which we will invariably fail at, if I'm brutally honest. Allegedly only, it's about land designation, allegedly only about 8% of land meets that 30 by 30 commitment currently. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should be disappointed if we don't meet it. We've only got six years to go. The reality is not going to happen. But if we got to 20%, I think we should be really proud of ourselves because we're, at least we're handing the land to the next generation in a better condition than we took it on. I've, uh, I completely agree. Um, Josiah, I just wanted to, and I've really sort of lifted this slightly from your, uh, your latest uh, copy of Sheaf, but you know, what are the greatest challenges and opportunities to you as a food processor uh, working with the farmers to get people to eat the food that we need to change farming, uh, you know, our diets as well, but also the policy, government policy, <coughs> what have we got to do? Yeah, I mean, there are, in order to create that 30 by 30, we will, we will need land use change one way or another. And that, that's maybe land use change that's perhaps in grazing or pasture at the moment or marginal land grade four or five. Uh, but it may also be in, in arable areas as well. And one of the ways that we can make that change is through a dietary shift. And we did some work back in 2008, which actually led to the foundation of, of Hodmadod, which was looking at whether a city the size of Norwich could feed itself. It's about 160,000 people, whilst at the same time meeting commitments to the rest of the UK and the rest of the world. And one of the things that was incredibly clear is that um, we need to eat a lot less meat. And um, that's, a, that's a challenging story to get across. Even more challenging, we need to eat more beans. And, you know, they have a very Hersher kind of difficult image and the kind of repositioning of beans within our diet and pulses of all sorts, lentils, chickpeas, uh, peas, um, and, and normalising those foods that for the rest of the world are really important. But in the UK, because we industrialised early, we stopped eating them and can lead to massive landscape change because we can produce more food, more protein on less land. If we're not feeding, as, as was talked about earlier, if we're not feeding... 50% of the cereals we grow to animals that are in you know, houses in the middle of those fields, then we free up a lot of land to do other things. And some of that will be nature recovery, uh, and some of that will obviously be producing these protein crops. And to do that, we need to, we need to understand how our diets affect landscape, and we need policy which encourages that shift. And one of the key policy instruments that government has in its hands and could quite easily implement is a change in procurement processes. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. government and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's from care homes and hospitals through to, through to schools and prisons, does an awful lot of food buying and a more progressive policy around the food that they're buying, which is based on the, on the other policies that government is demanding around nature recovery and about the environment and, and climate change and carbon, those things are all connected. And if we connected all those policies together and said, we're going to put literally our money where our mouth is and we're going to buy food that supports the landscape and the health and well-being of the UK mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to spend a lot of money on that process. And that could make a massive change. We've seen yeah. it happen in Denmark. You know, they've done amazing things by using positive public procurement to completely change farming and land use. I, I, I just think that, yeah. I just think it's an amazing uh, thing to think about, that actually if we change our diets, if we as consumers go out there as customers, to farmers go out and change our diets, we can actually, so step one, we change our diets, step two, we just see change in our conscious diet anyway. Because actually pulses not only flower and are better for pollinators, but they also fix nitrogen in the soil that then enables us to extend our rotation. So, I mean, I think that's in incredibly exciting. Um, Sarah, in your book, um, you tell us of your journey, and I'm really thinking about sort of this roots to success thing, is that you met some really incredibly inspiring farmers who had sort of worked as a hitty against the buffers mm. in the system they were in, uh, and then changed their business model. And, 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 and pretty much every single one of them was, was a, a success. And, you know, what, what sort of attributes do you think that we need from uh, the people who work within our indus industry to be able to change and adapt to the kind of things that we need to, 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 to achieve this success? Um, well, it's from the people you met? Yeah, it's, it's well, journey. the word success is really interesting because I think actually the common factor amongst all of them was an ease with failure. All of them were prepared to get it wrong and not have that end where they got to. And I, I think the majority of the people in the book, the majority of the farmers in the book, had got to a point where they were faced with two paths. One of them was to sell the farm or leave it, and one of them was to change. And that's from intensive pig farming uh, to 
uh, a council tenant farmer who took on an old knackered dairy that was growing maize. It, they'd got to a point where there was no way out. And I heard a statistic on a podcast the other day that said that about change. 60% of change happens because there's no other option left. 40% is peer pressure, which is why the conversation is so important. But I think what makes grounds well and other conversations about regenerative farming so interesting as opposed to maybe the conversations I had growing up with loads of farmer friends and my dad being a lad agent and in that world was... It's not boasting about yields at the bar. It's talking about how that companion cropping was a nightmare and how growing buckwheat with Aussie rape just didn't work, but it did work when you undersowed it with white clover or whatever combination they're talking about. That's an extraordinary, I think, pivot in conversation. Mm. Talking about, it's less, I mean, I may have overused this phrase at the Oxford Farming Conference last week, but it's less of a (laughs) cock-off. There's just... Less of a (laughs) what-off. There's less ego... I'm I'm going to the wrong bars. (laughs) (laughs) There's less of a ego uh, involved in... uh, And look, we we know absolutely why it it happened. If you have a government that says, the more you make, the more I'll pay you, that's what you get. Mm. And now we've got different incentives, particularly through kind of cluster groups, which and other uh, forms of collaboration. But I think one of the things that I wanted to respond to you about that about and also that I wanted particularly an urban audience to take away from maybe both um, all of our books is that this kind of that farming can teach you how to see properly it teaches you how to look it teaches you how to experience sound and your other senses differently and I had a really really kind of poignant example when I was Standing in our field the other day, looking at a disaster that we had done, which was a minimum. We tried because we are organic, we have to plow, and so we tried, experimented with um, some minimum tillage and put barley after oats. And I stood there with a friend of mine who is an organic farmer, much like you, a seasoned organic farmer, and said, All I can see are oats. And he went, Isn't that funny? All I can see is barley. And as soon as he said it, he was right. I saw amongst all the wild oats that I could see reaching out, I could see how much barley had actually grown. And in that encapsulated so much of both my journey, but also the journey of the farmers, that this taught them how to see differently. It taught them how to see failure differently. It taught them how to see landscape differently. And as soon as they started to see it, the community around them started to see it, started to notice wildflowers that hadn't been there for 40 years. And that is far wider than just what we eat. Yeah, that's, how we, that's how we move through the world. And, and the great thing about the groundswell thing, it is the sort of groundswell. People, you know, farmers are doing this thing. And, and on that note, I'm going to be speaking to Farmer Sange later on today between uh, six and seven. And, and if you want to hear a man with a different vision, uh, just please do come to that. I'm incredibly excited about uh, talking to uh, Sange about that. Um, now, we, we've run out of time, but we need to go to, to questions. Um, so, has, have we got any questions from the, the audience? Yes, um, William. Hello. Um, <clears throat> you left something out. I thought we might have done, William. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, I just wanted to put in a plea for horticulture. Once upon a time, yes. East Anglia and the whole of the country had an amazing horticultural industry. East Anglia was covered in orchards. This all was part of the cultural glue that sticks society together, local food, local vegetables. We've lost it. We've talked about arable, we've talked about landscape, but somewhere there is room for 50, 100-acre patches of horticulture in the middle of all of this to bring in further diversity. Diversity. What do you it's think? A, it's, a, no, it's a really good point. And actually, this is my bad, actually, because actually in the statistics, mm-hmm. I was so uh, wanting to tell the story about the terrible amount of feed that we're putting into, into pigs and chickens, uh, that fresh vegetables in, in uh, East Anglia did 320 million. So it is, it is an important part of that thing, and I missed that out. The horticulture that we see is, is endless hundreds, thousands That's of true. acres of potatoes, yeah. onions and cabbages. Yeah. That's not what a horticultural industry is about. No. And if you can find an or- orchard uh, producing and selling apples locally, well, you've done well because I can't. No, well, I, and it's, yeah. an import- it's an important point. Yes, sorry, I, you respond to that, please. I had very quickly, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's up the road from me the other day who's never been interested particularly in farming. 
And she said, I want to do exactly that. I want to know how, how, but I don't even know how. And I said, well, look, this is happening at the moment. I went to one the other day. It's community service agriculture. It doesn't really take place in a large amount of land. Uh, it begins as volunteers and ends, as up, ends up as a profit-making business. Places like Farm Ed in Oxfordshire are doing a brilliant showcase of it. And it has, of course, all the knock-on effects. It's not just being able to buy locally grown fruit and veg, but it knits the community together because they work on it and come to buy it. And I, I th there is, I think, quite a lot of... Well, I mean, Jenny Phelps from FWAG was saying there's funding around to get these rolling more. So there, I think we're maybe at the beginning of a reinvigoration of it. I hope we are. I, I, I'm slightly more sceptical, but <laughs> because there's a scale issue. So what, William is my colleague and co-founded Hobman Dodd with me, and he will be referring and know that part of the Norwich project that we looked at was how horticulture has completely disappeared from the hinterland of the city, where there, where there would once have been a thriving ring of market gardens supplying markets and restaurants and, and homes. That has completely gone, and we're completely dependent largely on large areas of Lincolnshire growing big-scale, field-scale veg, in Spain and France and Italy. And none of those are sustainable, largely because the fence need re-wetting and Spain and Italy and France are getting less and less viable for horticultural production and they're not going to be exporting as much of it. So we do need smaller scale traditional market gardens, close two or three acres, five acres, ten acres, closer to market towns, supplying those towns. Um, the agroforestry we talked about can be fruit. You know, we can have fruit agro agroforestry systems and I think... Um, Maple Farm K Kelsale are Briggs, doing that with Apple, yeah. Stephen Briggs doing that as well. So I think there are systems that we can do to replace that, but there's a big missing gap in education, people having the skills to do this work, we've lost it completely, and the infrastructure that goes with that, the distribution and the markets which have, which have disappeared as well. And um, I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's a big challenge actually. Mm. Yeah. I would say maybe agroforestry is a, has a huge part to play in this. And Part of that is perception, because I write a scene in the book about where I even s I say the word agroforestry, <laughs> to not even suggesting we do it. And the response I got was, how do you get a bloody combine between a bloody row of bloody trees? Which, unless you've seen it, that is a, possibly a fair question. But then you go and see it, and you realise that the alleys are spaced to fit modern farm equipment. And if you're as good as Stephen Briggs at the numbers, you work out it takes up 8% of the entire land mass, and yet you're, he's got a variety of English apples. Mm. And his apples amazing. now often generate more income than his cereal. Mm. Any, any other questions? Yes, a gentleman up here. Thank you. Um, Charles Gooch, I, I um, completely agree with what you've, you've been saying, um, particularly about education and, and the, the desire for most, the vast majority of farmers to farm more sustainably in the future. But would the panel agree that with the loss of area-based subsidies and replacement by the new ELMS and SFI, would, would the panel agree that the government has let us down in terms of policy and replacing those subsidies with, with um, alternatives um, guidance and payment uh, for public goods? Well, as Jake's been involved in all this. <laughs> um, so I think, we, uh, I think the, uh, the farming community or the land occupying community um, have in the last few days been quite vocal in challenging government's failure to deliver a, a replacement for an area-based payment. Um, I think uh, there was pretty small token stuff at Oxford last week. Actually, if you go into the detail, it's even worse. Sarah's just planted 2,000 metres of hedgerow. She could have, she's only been paid £11 a metre. If she had delayed it, she could have been paid £22 a metre. She's actually, a lot of it's going to cost her to plant as opposed to um, uh, have any sort of um, break-even point for delivering ecosystem services. The concept of the 25-year environment plan and the concept of paying farmers to deliver public goods is admirable and we should embrace that. It's a complete failure by the British government to deliver something that is workable. And as we transition from direct support payment to an ecosystem service payment to reward farmers for best practice, um, we, need to see, uh, we need to see that money move from one to the other. Uh, most farmers, I believe, don't want to be slaves to subsidies, but actually they would be happy to be rewarded 
for the delivering of clean water, healthy soils, rich and vibrant nature and access. So, um, but actually we need to value it. And half the problem is there's a wonderful report by Professor Descupta, which is about how we value nature. Quite clearly, DEFRA and the Treasury aren't putting a value on nature and people's health and our food and our landscapes because of their complete failure since we left Europe, since we had the Environment Act and the Agricultural Act, which basically enables this to take place, and nothing's happened. Allegedly, the Secretary of State, who's speaking at the NFU conference in February, will probably make some sort of announcement, and we need to come down on her like a ton of bricks because it's going to be seriously short of what was required. Have we got, have we got one more question? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to ask my wife to ask a question, no. <laughs> <laughs> James, James. She was, she was going to barrack me, actually, I think. For John or, for John or Jake, um, uh, as John knows, I'm pretty passionate about hedgerows and a massive keen hedge layer. What price does DEFRA need to offer to really change the, the game and get farmers planting hedgerows uh, to, the, to hundreds or thousands of kilometres back, back into the landscape? So, so announced last week was £22.70 per metre to establish a hedge. Actually, I think at current inflation prices, that's, uh, that's doable. The frustration, when you look into the detail, that's, that's been capped. That's capped at £20,000. So you might want to put in 4,000 metres, but actually you can only put in 2,000 metres. That's frustrating. Um, what is the value? Well, the value, when I've, I've done a deal with a corporate, uh, and I've delivered land use change because it was a sensible land use change. Um, and they're paying me £1,000 a hectare and don't even think twice about it. So from my perspective, irrespective of income foregone plus costs, mm. actually the true value of uh, delivering all of the above of a natural capital actually comes at that sort of level. Um, and, I th and I think that's we know where that we look at the blended finance option where actually DEFRA... Um, in, uh, incentivize for an action, but the, but the private sector actually pays for an outcome. That's where we get to those sort of figures. And I'm currently in a landscape recovery pilot on about 2,000 2, hectares on the North Norfolk coast and down the Chalk Stream River valleys. And we're working at those, that sort of level, about a thousand pounds a hectare on a blended finance option. One paying for management, prescription and, or, or an action and the other paying for an outcome. Mm. Listen, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, can I just remind you all to go and uh, go to the bookshop and buy these good people's wares? It's very important that you do that. I think we're si are we signing? Are you signing? Are we? They're signing, doing yeah. some signing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, can, I, can I just say that um, I, I've obviously been ignoring the lady in the front of here to tell me, you know, I've got to stop now, but my Apple Watch has just told me I've got to stand, so it must be nearly an hour. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs> anyway.